All right. Well, um, week five, I guess it is. Uh, I want to start the same way we did last time, uh, looking at that passage in Second Timothy two fifteen. Um, kind of looking at a, a Christ centered approach to teaching the scriptures. In this passage, we looked at last time. Second Timothy two fifteen says, "Do your best to present yourself to God." as one approved, a worker who has no need to be ashamed, and then here it is, rightly handling the word of truth. Rightly handling the word of truth, implying there is a wrong way to handle the word of truth. There are many wrong ways to handle a wor- the word of truth, but right here, it's important that it says rightly. Um, I was thinking about that right before we started tonight, just the importance of rightly handling the word of truth so that we can stand before the Lord as one approved, no need to be ashamed. And so, um, you know, this is a a biblical counseling class, and um, it's probably more accurate to to call it a Christ-centered biblical counseling textbook that we're working through. It's called Christ-centered biblical counseling. I think that's actually better because you could do biblical counseling in unbiblical ways. Um, there are moralistic uh, ways to teach the scriptures that don't get to the heart and that ultimately don't help people in their problems. And so um, they're going to have little lasting effect and power. Uh, I'm not interested personally in spending my life teaching the Bible in ways that are not going to be fruitful and effective and powerful. I want to be able to open this book and speak to people's hearts in such a way it's going to change them long term. And so there is a way in which we can do that. And that's what we're trying to do, to rightly handle the word of truth. Um, And just think about, I mean, think about how many problems that you have personally. Think about how messed up your life is. I mean, those areas. And then think there are people that are more messed up than you. And, and that these are the people that God is calling us to minister the Word of God to, that He's going to bring into our path. And so we need to be ready uh, to not just say what the Bible says merely, but to say it in the way in which the Bible wants us to say it and to speak it uh, directly to the heart. Because many, many ways to teach the Bible kind of deal with behavioral issues on the surface level. So they might change or shift behaviors Whereas a true uh, way to minister the word of God to someone is to get up under the behaviors at the heart motives and intentions that's deeper. Because that's where you can really get to um, true lasting change. And Jesus said uh, in Matthew 15, uh, 18 through 20, for out of the heart come evil thoughts, murder, adultery, sexual morality, theft, false witness, slander. Those seems like behavioral things, but he says from the heart those things come. This is what defiles a person. And so all these actions are coming from the heart. And secular counseling, uh, most Christian counseling, are are merely dealing with behavioral surface-level issues and aren't uh, getting to the heart and applying the grace of Christ to the heart. So, Again, and and let's remember what the heart is. Uh, When we say heart, we're not talking about the blood pumping muscle inside our body. We're talking about what in Scripture is oftentimes called the soul, the spirit, the inner man. Those are inner. Those are synonymous, interchangeable terms. Okay, so this is talking about the inner person, who we truly are, what makes us do what we do. That's the heart, and we want to be able to minister the Word of God to that. So here, Hebrews four twelve. Uh, Hebrews 4.12 tells us the Word of God is given to us to divide the soul, to, to get up into the soul of someone. So the Word of God, it says, is living and active, sharper than a two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and spirit, of joints and of marrow, discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. So that's where people's real problems are. That's where our problems really are. So guilt, loneliness, depression, anxiety, sexual sin, anger, broken relationships, uh, abuse, and on and on and on and on. Ultimately, our heart problems and the scriptures, we need to be able to 
speak them in such a way to get to those heart issues. And here, here's something that um, I'm, I'm the type, maybe some of you are like this, I like to poke holes in things and try to see, is this, you know, is this really true or is there exceptions here? And so, you know, a, a question that we could ask is what is truly sufficient to help people with their problems? And then I would always kind of ask the second problem, well, what about such and such? You know, are there exceptions? Is the scripture really sufficient? Is the Bible really enough or do we, what about physical or psychological problems not related to the heart? Um, what do we do with those type things? So this could be, uh, you know, things that people would throw out, bipolar, Alzheimer's, uh, PTSD, what about the, you know, neurological type problems, things that medicine address, aren't th those aren't necessarily heart problems, right? And so I would say first, uh, that's a small minority of things that we're going to deal with, first of all. Um, if you minister to a lot of people, that would be a very small amount of people that would actually have something that would fall in that category. Um, and there's, and so doctors can be helpful, you know, to get a doctor involved at times, but y'all know many times doctors misdiagnose on these type things. Um, back in my childhood, I was misdiagnosed with ADD and I was just lazy. And because how do you really diagnose ADD? I mean, you look at just li patterns of laziness and you go, oh, he has ADD. Well, it's probably that the kid's lazy most of the time. Not that there isn't a true ADD, but there's misdiagnosed. But even if someone truly is diagnosed and, um, and they're given a correct medication and that medication even works, is that going to truly deal with all their problems? Most medications would never even claim such a thing. So say, take depression for an example. You give someone an antidepressant, does that really solve all their problems? No, it's going to maybe numb it. Antidepressants wouldn't even claim to eliminate depression. They would just say it would kind of numb it, make it more, you could cope with it a little better, but you still got tons of other issues that you're, you're going to have to deal with. And so even in these extreme cases, we could throw out uh, PTSD again, bipolar, you know, someone takes a medication, but it doesn't solve all their issues. You take maybe one thing off the table and you got 20 other things still left to deal with. And so, so we take, so I'm, I'm throwing this out to say even extreme cases uh, that we might think of or deal with, uh, we still have to get back to the, this question, what is truly sufficient to help people with their heart problems? Because that's really where most of our problems are at. So, um, and, and here's the other thing I would ask. What is truly sufficient to help people? What, what do we mean by help people? Right, yeah. I mean, it, yeah, and then we would have to mean, what do we mean by cure, right? Because what, what are we ultimately saying here? I brought this up a few weeks ago. Many people would say uh, help someone is to just help them get through life a little better, make their life a little easier, maybe a little more happy. And if, if that were the case, we have lots of options. We can use the law. We can use, you know, false teachings. We can use prosperity gospels, self-help, a lot of psychological techniques. I mean, there's lots of options if all we're trying to do is just help someone feel better. But if, but if we're trying to help someone glorify God and enjoy Him forever, or be conformed to the image of Christ, then we need the Word of God and the power of the Holy Spirit and the gospel that gets to the heart and changes the person. And so that's one distinguishing factor between biblical counseling and some other approaches is that what we mean by helping someone is going to be different. Um, we believe that Christ is all sufficient to heal the whole person, body, mind, and soul. And so this is what I've been trying to, um, trying to review the last few weeks is, uh, I already covered that. I'm not doing good in my slides. Review for the last two weeks. So Jesus reveals himself to us in his sufficient word by the power of the Holy Spirit. So we talked about a few weeks ago, the different names of God in the Old Testament, and how they all culminate in the name of Jesus, the name above all names. And we talked about last week, how you can't separate the word of Christ from the person of Christ. So that when we minister the word of Christ to someone, we are ministering the person of Christ to them. You bring them the word, you bring them Christ. They encounter the word, they encounter Christ. So that elevates our view of scripture 
and what it means to minister scripture, but we said it's not enough merely to have the word. We need the spirit of God as well, illuminating for someone uh, what the scripture is actually saying so that they believe Jesus is all sufficient. Jesus is all satisfying. And the spirit of God is what's needed to convince of that. Matthew Henry said this, uh, the New Testament will be a killing letter if shown as a mere system or form without dependence on God, the Holy Spirit, to give the quickening power. So this is a, a ministry of death apart from the Holy Spirit. You Just reading the Bible alone apart from the Holy Spirit does you no good. And so that was the last few weeks. And here's what I want to talk about tonight. Um, I want to talk about sufficiency and basically two things about sufficiency. We are not sufficient. Jesus and his word is sufficient. Okay, that's, that's the two fundamental things I want to look at tonight. Um, I don't know, if, honestly, there, there's probably not a lot more applicable to the ministry of the word, whether it's preaching or counseling or one-on-one -on -one ministry, than, than this. Um, it's very simplistic. This is not complex. You know, a child could understand what we're going to talk about tonight, which might be frustrating <laughs> to, to some of you. I don't know. Um, but every time I, every time I counsel or get up to preach, I'm essentially, I might not be thinking of it in these terms, but I'm essentially thinking I can't do this and you can Lord, you know, I'm not sufficient. You are sufficient. I mean, this is, this is the, the posture that we must have as we minister to others. That's not just theologically true statements. That's reality. That is, that's reality and it sure does help when we acknowledge it. And um, we're going to look at that tonight. Um, we, we, it's not helpful to try to have a higher view of ourselves than Jesus had of himself. And Jesus said in Matthew 5.30, I can do nothing on my own. So Jesus on this earth had such a dependent view of himself upon another the Father, uh, that's the pattern He set for us and ministering to others. And so again, you know, this is not sophisticated, you know, some really technical kind of approach to understanding the human psyche. And I feel like if we get into too much of that, what could actually happen is we start working against this and that's really going to be a problem. You know, if, we, if you were to leave a class like this or, and you were to think, man, I can do this but you're only trusting in yourself. I mean, if it's building self-sufficiency, we might have made things worse in terms of the Lord getting glory from your ministry. And so I want to just kind of lay some very simple foundation tonight and look at this first point. You are not sufficient. I can do nothing on my own, Jesus said. But look at, look at this passage. 2 Corinthians 3.5 says, Not that we are sufficient, in ourselves to claim that anything is coming from us, but our sufficiency is from God who made us sufficient to be ministers of a new covenant, not of the letter, but of the spirit for the letter kills, but the spirit gives life. That really encapsulates a lot of what we've been talking about the last two weeks. John Gill, Puritan, uh, John Gill said this, we do not ascribe anything to ourselves to any power of ours, to any self-sufficiency in us. For we are not sufficient of ourselves, neither for the works of the ministry, nor for the conversion of sinners, nor for the faith and hope in God, nor for any spiritual work whatsoever, not even to think any good thing. We are not able of ourselves to meditate with judgments and affections upon the word of God, to study the scriptures, to collect them uh, in, in ways fitting for ministry, much less with freedom and boldness to speak them to, edif to the edification of others, still less able to impress them upon the heart. Our sufficiency is of God to think, to speak, to act for his glory. So again, as, as counselors, as ministers sitting there with someone uh, with the word of God, we aren't sufficient to, to adequately help them. They aren't sufficient to adequately be helped that we're, we're both 
counselee and counselor uh, completely dependent on the Lord. And I'm convinced at this point that's a really good thing. For us to recognize our weakness as a counselor or as a minister and for them to recognize their weakness and inability to help themselves actually puts us at the best place possible. Isaiah 57, 15, God says, I dwell in high and holy places, so God is in heaven, and also with him who is of a contrite and lowly spirit to revive the spirit of the lowly and to revive the heart of the contrite. So God's way up in heaven. He's way down with those who are humble and contrite and understand their dependence on Him. Martin Luther said, God receives none, but those who are forsaken, restores health to none, but those who are sick, gives sight to none but the blind, gives life to none but the dead. He has mercy on none but the wretched and gives grace to none but those who are in disgrace. And so I want to do a quick survey of the Old Testament to show um, this is always how God's worked. He takes human insufficiency and it meets God's sufficiency. And that's literally uh, what we see throughout the whole Bible. I'll give you, we'll look at one text real fast to show this. And then I'll, I'll give a few high points. Uh, Isaiah 40, 28 and 31. Have you not known, have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He does not faint or grow weary. His un understanding is unsearchable. That's God's self-sufficiency, right? And it says, he gives power. So out of his self-sufficiency, he gives power to what? To the faint. To him who has no might, he increases strength. Even youths shall faint and be weary, and young men shall fall exhaust, exhausted. But those who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall, walk, they shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. That's literally, that, those themes are, are going to be all through the Bible. So you see David and Goliath. Who's David? He's a weak little boy, weak little fighting instrument, and he takes out big bad Goliath. Um, you see... Joseph interpreting Pharaoh's dreams. He's the youngest of 12. He's thrown into a pit. Gets down to the lowest of the low, literally. And God raises him up to the highest of the high. God is strong in his weakness. We see the nation of Israel. God chose the weakest and the least of all the nations of the earth. And through them shows his strength as this great nation. Gideon is a huge one. Uh, God comes to, to Gideon in, in, this, in the area of Midian and, and says, how, and, he, and says, I want to use you essentially uh, to win this battle. And, and Gideon says, how can I save Israel? My clan is the weakest in Manasseh and I am the least in my father's house. And the Lord says, get together an army. And he says, it's too many soldiers because if you win the battle, uh, you might boast saying, it's my hand who's done this. I am, we are sufficient for these things. And so God, they start off with 32,000. God says that's too many. And then they get down to 22,000, then eventually down to 10,000. God says it's still too big, down to 300. And that 300 take out a massive army of people. The apostles, 12 apostles, who did Jesus choose as his team? The weakest, right? Just regular people. Fishermen, young college-age guys to start churches to literally turn the world upside down. So he shows his power in weakness. And I mean, why and why would God what is the theology or the or the reasoning behind why God would do that? Well, what would give more glory to God? If he uses weak people to show off his power in and through them? Yes. 300 people take out a whole army. God gets the glory for that, not the 300 people. 12 apostles change the world. God gets the glory of that for that, not the 12 apostles, because you can't accredit it to the weak people. You go, clearly, they didn't, aren't responsible for this. Their powerful God did this. And so that's, that's how the Lord has always worked. Uh, let me show us a New Testament example. 
Uh, go to 2 Corinthians if you have a Bible or your phone. We'll take a minute more on this passage. 2 Corinthians 10. As you're going there, I'll just uh, give us some context. 1 Corinthians starts talking about strength and weakness. 2 Corinthians ends talking about strength and weakness. Really, you could say that the book of 1 and 2 Corinthians is about strength and weakness and, and Paul trying to correct their wrong views of what that means. Um, they, they kind of had the view, you know, God's a strong God and God likes to pick strong Christians to be his strong leaders. And Paul's just like, you have no idea how God works. And he spends the, the two chapters at the end of 2 Corinthians debunking that and kind of uh, deconstructing their, their wrong views of strength and weakness. And so 2 Corinthians 10, uh, we'll start in verse 10. And, and picture the scene, okay? You've got a letter here that Paul wrote and sent to the church in Corinth. It's a lot of little house churches scattered around, so they're probably getting copies of this letter, meeting in their various places, and they're all to read this letter to all the church that's there. Um, and so, you know, you can picture this is an exciting thing. You'd been reading the same letter every week, probably, and now you've got another letter that has arrived from Paul and you are excited because you're like, well, this man is uh, an apostle, probably the strongest man of God alive today. You know, Jesus himself met him on the road to Damascus and spoke to him and made him an apostle. He's preached to thousands. He's planted all these churches. He's written portions of scripture. Even handkerchiefs touched him and healed people. The apostle Paul has written us a letter and you're just, you know, kids don't get up and go to the bathroom. We're all sitting and listening to this for the whole time and everybody's very eager to hear what Paul has to say. And so in 2 Corinthians 10, he kind of addresses the first problem and he talks about super apostles. So in verse 12, he says this, 2 Corinthians 10 verse 12, when they compare themselves with one another, they are without understanding. And he makes sure they understand what really matters. And he says in verse 18, for it is not the one who commends himself who's approved, but the one whom the Lord commends. And then he deals with the second problem, second, second Corinthians chapter 11. He mentioned these super apostles again. They're very, he, he apparently thinks they're very dangerous to, to these churches and says in verse 15, they are disguising themselves as servants of righteousness disguising. They're not really servants of righteousness. They're not really apostles or Christians, but they're just claiming to be. And he says, here's how you can recognize them. They're very arrogant and self-sufficient. That's basically how you'll recognize them. And Paul apparently thinks that arrogance and self-sufficiency is such a danger to the young church. He says, he uses this really strange strategy that he says, I'm going to begin to, you think, you think all these really strong, boasting, of how big their ministries are and how great their gifts are. All these men are so awesome. I'm going to boast, but I'm going to boast about my weaknesses to shame you and rebuke you and how you're thinking. And so Paul starts boasting of his weaknesses. And so in 2 Corinthians 11, starting in verse 32, he says, At Damascus, the governor was trying to kill me. So some of the brothers put me into a basket and let me down through a window in the wall, and then I ran away. That's not a very flattering story to tell people, is it? I mean, if you were trying to get killed, you would be like, man, I was so brave. Like, I wasn't even scared. And you would, he, he said, I'm so scared they let me down in a basket. You know, and you got little short Paul, he's getting let down in a basket. It's just not a great, you know, he's boasting of his weakness. 2 Corinthians 11, um, I'm sorry, 2 Corinthians 12, verse 1 and 2 he says, if I must go on boasting, I will go on about visions and res revelations of the Lord. For 14 years ago, th this man, key phrase, this man who went up to the third heaven, whether in the body or out of the body, I don't know, God knows. He heard things that man cannot be told, which man may not utter. On behalf of this man, I will boast. Later we find out this man is Paul himself and he won't claim it um, because he's humble and he doesn't want to talk about this amazing experience he had. Uh, but he just says, you know, this man. And then we find out uh, in verse 7, he, he gives another um, part three of his boasting of weakness. 
And he starts talking about that thorn in the flesh. And he says, to keep me from being too elated or prideful because of the surpassing greatness of the revelations, a thorn was given to me in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to harass me, to keep me from being too elated or too prideful. Now, the thorn in the flesh, you know, we think it's usually, most people think it's some sort of physical suffering or an enemy. Uh, But apparently it was given to him to keep him weak and dependent upon the Lord, that he wouldn't be self-sufficient. And so here's what Jesus himself says to Paul. 2 Corinthians 12, 9. My grace is sufficient for you. For my power is made perfect, key word, made perfect in weakness. That's really huge. We really need to pay attention to that word in. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly of my weakness so that the power of Christ might rest upon me. For the, for the sake of Christ, and I'm content with weakness, insults, hardships, persecutions, calamities. For when I am weak, then I am strong. What a weird way to view this. What if we began to view our weaknesses as actually the places in our life where God's strength could be most manifest. He says, Jesus said, my power is made perfect in weakness. Paul says the same thing in uh, Romans 8, 26. The Spirit helps us in our weakness. Uh, That that should just be encouraging to us, is it not? (laughs) We all have weak areas in our life that we are just, I'm so weak in this area. Well, that's where the Lord can be the strongest. So God doesn't always remove our weaknesses, but he wants to be strong in and through those weaknesses. And that's what Paul could say, I will boast all the more gladly of my weaknesses so that the power of Christ might rest upon me. So at the very moment where we can depend on God, not relying on our own strength, in that moment, the Lord can become strong in our weakness. At the moment we're thinking, I can't do this, Lord. I need your help. I'm weak. I don't know what to say to this person who just told me this issue in their life and I need to say something to them. In that moment, the Lord can be, he can make his power perfect in weakness. So don't, don't sit there and pray, you know, Lord, make me weak. You are weak. <laughs> okay. Just recognize it. Just acknowledge it. So there's Christians, there's two kinds of Christians. There's those who are weak and don't acknowledge it, and there's those who are weak and do acknowledge it. We're all weak. Richard Baxter, who's a Puritan pastor, he was laying on his deathbed, and someone was trying to encourage him, I guess, and was saying, all the, you know, oh, the Lord brought so much good from your ministry and your writings, and, you know, just trying to encourage the man. And, and, uh, and he said to him, I, w- I was a pin in the hand of God. And what praise is due to a pin? I mean, this is, <laughs> I mean, this is someone who understands this passage. That we are not sufficient in ourselves to claim anything that's coming from us, but our sufficiency is from God who made us sufficient as ministers of the new covenant. So the thing that you've got to, this is the kind of the balance that we have to have. We need to say, in and of myself, I'm not sufficient. John Mark is not sufficient, but I'm not just John Mark. I have the Holy Spirit of God inside me. Therefore, I am sufficient. His power is in me, and therefore I am. So it says in the passage, second, or is the passage here? Here, let me get to the passage. Not that we are sufficient in ourselves to claim as anything coming from us, but our sufficiency is from God, who has made us sufficient to be ministers of the new covenant. So don't forget that part. And then 2 Corinthians 9, 8 it says that God is able to make all grace abound to you so that having all sufficiency in all things at all times, you may abound in every good work. That's an awesome promise. That's Second Corinthians 9.8. So our sufficiency is in Christ and His Spirit, um, but also His Word. So I want to talk about the sufficiency of Scripture for the last part of this lecture. Let me say something about the, uh, the Reformation. Y'all know most churches are celebrating today, and rightly so, 500-year anniversary of the Reformation. Uh, so I want to quote Louis Burkhoff. 
he uh, wrote in his systematic theology. And he was, he was writing about sufficiency of Scripture, and he said, um, he said that the doctrine of the sufficiency of Scripture, let me get to this, the doctrine of the sufficiency of Scripture really came from uh, the church coming out of Catholicism and trying to think through, you know, is the Bible really sufficient to deal with all that we need it to deal with? all the problems in life, all the things we run into, is it really sufficient or do we need popes and councils? Because that was the big teaching in that day. And, and so what happened was uh, the church became really refined in their thinking regarding how they viewed the scriptures. And three central things kind of emerged, uh, Burkhoff says, and he mentions these three. The clarity of scripture, and what's meant by that is that uh, that not every passage in Scripture is easy to understand. Obviously, there's difficult things to understand in the Bible, but the Bible speaks to us in simple, comprehensible forms that anyone earnestly seeking salvation or knowledge of God, the Holy Spirit will help them understand. So you don't need a priesthood. You don't need a church. We don't technically need a teacher, although God obviously uses that and providentially puts teachers in our lives. We have the Holy Spirit who is the teacher. And so the scriptures are clear enough that the Holy Spirit can help us understand what God has revealed in the Word. That's the clarity of scripture. The second, the the scripture is the best teacher of scripture. This is a really huge thing for us to make sure we understand. Um, The more you read the Bible, the more you understand the Bible. I talk about this. um, I don't know who we all, I know Cody says this to people, I say this to people. Um, The more that we read the Bible, the more we understand the Bible. So the first time you read the Bible for a new Christian, you just, you're like, you're pretty lost, right? You're not, you're not going to see much. It's little things are going to jump out. Uh, But four or five times going through 10 years down the road in your life, it's making a lot more sense. 20, 30 years down the road, pieces are coming together. The Bible's making far more sense. And what was teaching you, the Bible was teaching you. The more you read it, the more understandable it is. So we have that. But here's the bigger hermeneutical principle that I want to point out. The more clear passages of Scripture illuminate the less clear passages of Scripture. Scripture teaches Scripture. So, for example, um, if you have a hundred verses that say one thing, and then you have one little obscure verse over here that everybody goes, I don't even know what that means, and it seems to contradict all 100 verses that say a very clear thing, we understand that weird, obscure verse based off of these very clear verses. It's a hermeneutical principle. When you're trying to understand something in Scripture, apply that. So uh, actually, Johnny White, I don't know how many of y'all were here. Uh, Dr. Johnny White was, what, four, five or six weeks ago. Someone asked in one of the lectures, or after one of the lectures, they said, what is that weird verse that um, talks about baptizing people on behalf of the dead? I remember someone asked that question. And Johnny White used this principle to answer that question. He said, well, actually, you know, that is a very difficult verse to understand, but, and there's about a hundred interpretations of that. And so clearly there's no consensus among Christians as to what it means. And, but here, and then he, he said, so that's the really weird, obscure verse, but here's what we do know about baptism. Baptism means this, this, and this. Here's what death is. It's appointed to man once to die and then to face judgment. We know all of this about death. We know all of this about baptism. And so that's what's clear. Here's what's really weird and unclear. So let's understand this first in light of all of this. Okay, and that's a really big thing that kind of came out of the Reformation was this hermeneutical principle. Um, And the Westminster Confession of Faith actually says this about it. The infallible rule of interpretation of Scripture is the Scriptures itself and therefore... Uh, When there is a question about the true or false sense of any scripture, it must be searched down by other places that speak more clearly. Okay, so same thing I was just trying to say. All right, and then the third is the sufficiency of scripture. That this really came out of the Reformation with a lot more clarity. We'll let Wayne Grudem give us a definition of the sufficiency of scripture. It says the sufficiency of Scripture means that Scripture contains all the words of God He intends His people to have at every stage of redemptive history. And that 
it now contains everything we need God to tell us for salvation, for trusting him perfectly, and for obeying him perfectly. And so, again, what is Scripture sufficient to do? He breaks it down into five categories. Uh, so if you had his book, hopefully, I, I hope all y'all will buy Wayne Grudem's Systematic Theology. You can get it for like $30, $30 I think. It's well worth it. Uh, very simple systematic theology, but the chapter on sufficiency of Scripture, he gives these five things. So we'll quickly go through them. Uh, the Bible is sufficient to lead us to salvation. So um, I'll give, I got a scripture next to each of these. Um, read them fast. 2 Timothy 3.15, From childhood you have been acquainted with the sacred writings which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. So how, how, how is someone to be saved? Can you just walk outside and look at the stars and go, wow, man, the trees and the stars, like, I'm, I'm going to trust Christ for salvation. Like, I mean, you would have no clue, right? There's no way through creation you're just going to come to a knowledge of salvation. The only way someone is saved is because they've heard what the scriptures say regarding salvation and regarding Christ. Okay, So the Bible is sufficient to lead us to salvation. And the Bible is sufficient to order our affections. Uh, Psalms 1, verse 1 and 2, Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sitters, nor sits in the seat of scoffers, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. John 15, I love this. Uh, he, Jesus explains that if you abide in his words, abide in his words, okay, reading, meditating, believing, abiding, obeying, then what will happen is your joy will be complete. That his joy, it says, will be in you and your joy will be complete. To abiding in his words. And so the Bible is sufficient to order our affections, to increase our joy. Uh, the Bible is sufficient to prosper us spiritually. So the rest of Psalms 1 talks about he is like a tree the person who meditates on the word is like a tree planted by streams of water that yields its fruit in its season. Its leaf does not wither and all he does, he prospers. And the prospering that it's talking about is not financial prosperity, but a spiritual prosperity. The person who abides and meditates on the word prospers spiritually. So if you want to be a person who's just spiritually strong in the Lord, the word of God is how that happens. The Bible is sufficient to strengthen you and prosper you spiritually. Um, then fourth, the Bible is sufficient to reveal our heart motives, to get to our heart, like I talked about earlier. Um, it, it, let me relate this to counseling. So when you're sitting with someone, I mean, this could be your, your mom talking to your mom or talking to a, a child or, or someone at work. How often, try to recognize this when people are talking, how often does someone blame something going on in their life from their childhood experience or uh, blame something going on in their life because of different circumstances in their life, their boss was did this to them or this happened in their life, and just kind of blame shifting, kind of pushing the problem onto everything. We all do this, okay, but kind of moving that thing around and, and pushing it onto nature or nurture. I was born this way. I was influenced by this in my life. And, um, and what's good about the scripture is that it kind of gets down under that and can minister to us and give us hope and change us regardless of what has happened in our past or what we're going through in the present or what happens to us biologically. And so it gets down to the heart. Uh, Proverbs 4.23 says, watch over your heart with all diligence, for from it flow the springs of life. I quoted earlier Matthew 15, uh, what comes out of the mouth proceeds from the heart. This is what defiles a person out of the heart, come evil thoughts, murder, adultery, sexual immorality, theft, false witness, and slander. So the Bible is sufficient to deal with the heart, which in turn leads to actions and emotions changing. And then fifthly, uh, the Bible is sufficient to change us and, or conform us into the image of Christ. So John seventeen seventeen, 
Jesus says, sanctify them in truth. Your word is truth. Maybe I should pause there. You know, again, when we're trying to help someone, uh, the main goal, they might think that the biggest issue in their life is that their job isn't working out how they wanted it to, or their kid isn't obeying. But what we know is, actually, God's biggest thing he's trying to do in you is conform you to the image of Christ. So many times someone will come to us or we'll hear someone kind of their biggest problem isn't actually their biggest problem. It feels like it's their biggest problem, but the biggest issue that God's worried about is conforming them to the image of his son. And what we need to understand is verses like John 17, 17, or these other two I'm about to mention, that what is God, what can God do for that person through his word? His word is sufficient to conform them to his image, to sanctify them, right? All we need for life and godliness is here, the Bible says. That's 2 Peter 1, 3. 2 Timothy 3.17 says this is how we can be equipped for every good work. So again, the Word of God is, is uniquely uh, designed to change us at the deepest levels that begin to change us. We're changed internally and that in turn begins to change us externally. Uh, here, here's the principle that biblical counseling is built on. This is John 15, 15. Jesus said this, Everything that I learned from my Father, I have made known to you. Think about that. Everything that I have learned from my Father, I have made known to you. Now, are we wrong at that point to say, why didn't you talk about this issue, Lord? Why didn't you give us this? Everything that I learned from my Father, I have made known to you, Jesus said. If, if we needed to know it, God said it to us. That's a very simple thing for us to understand, but it's really important. That means whatever in the Bible, whatever God has put in the Bible is what we need to know. And what that person that we're trying to minister to needs to know. It doesn't mean that there isn't things outside the Bible that wouldn't be helpful. It just means that God didn't leave anything out that's important. That's something fundamental that we need to make sure we understand. So here's some common problems. Let me see where I'm at in my... All right, I'll come back to this in just a second. Uh, common problems uh, that the Bible deals with, relational conflicts, financial pressures, responsibilities... Uh, responses to physical health and illness, parenting questions, loneliness. Those are some kind of common problems. More modern problems, depression, anxiety, uh, schizophrenia, ADD. Um, so one counselor said this. Now listen, to, this is helpful. The Bible doesn't speak to each of these problems as, as, a, as an encyclopedia would. It doesn't offer techniques for change that look like they would have come out of a cookbook. Okay, so we sometimes want that. Why doesn't it give a one, two, three process here to help this person? Like, that's not how the Bible was laid out. But through prayerful meditation on Scripture and a willingness to receive theological guidance from each other, we find that the biblical teaching on creation, fall, redemption, and restoration are useful insights to help us in all issues of life. Okay, so again, if we had God speaking literally into every specific issue, how big would the Bible be? It would be massive. We would never even read it or be able to find anything. It would just be enormous. And God didn't have to do that. He put what we need in the Scriptures, and it's sufficient. Uh, here's a great verse. Maybe one of the best verses on the sufficiency of Scripture. Whoa, I just turned off the slide. Okay. The law of the Lord is perfect, restoring the soul. I just want to look at that first part. The law of the Lord is perfect. Now, this word could be translated sufficient. The law of the Lord is sufficient, complete, restoring the soul. could be translated heart. The law of the Lord, the word of God, is sufficient, restoring the heart. Rightly ordering the heart, getting you to become who you need to be. 
The law of the Lord is perfect or complete or sufficient to do that. Commentator Albert Barnes wrote about this passage and said a few things that I think are helpful. He said, the meaning of perfect is that scripture lacks nothing for its completeness, nothing in order that it nothing in order that it might be what it should be. It is complete as a revelation of divine truth. It is complete as a rule of conduct. It is absolutely true. It is adapt to communicate wisdom to the needs of man. It is unerring. It is an unerring guide of content or conduct. There is nothing there which would lead men into error or sin. There is nothing essential for man to know which may not be found there. Okay, The word of the Lord is perfect or sufficient restoring the heart, the soul, the inner person. Uh, let me give us two. Westminster Shorter Catechism gets at this. What, what do the scriptures principally teach? You know catechism, they ask the question, give the answer. What do the scriptures principally teach? The scriptures principally teach that man is to be, what man is to believe concerning God and what duly God requires of man. Okay, so that's limited. It's not uh, going to get it. You know, if my car breaks down on the way home tonight, I can't turn to the Bible and find a verse on how to fix it, <laughs> right? I, I can't learn how to play basketball better by reading the Bible. Right? The Bible isn't meant to do everything. It's meant to do what's needed, what God wants to happen. Um, and so here's a little better, more complete definition, the Westminster Confession of Faith. The whole counsel of God concerning all things necessary for his own glory. This is what it, sufficiency of Scripture is. All things necessary for his own glory, man's salvation, faith, and life, is either expressly set down in Scripture or by good and necessary consequence may be deduced from Scripture. So you're going to have to think about Scripture. You're going to have to meditate on things to be able to know how to apply it to people. It's not always just like on the surface, plain and clear. Oh, you have, you know, anxiety issues. There's 50 verses that come to mind. You might think of one or two, but there might be hundreds of verses that could apply to that situation. You might just have to think about it. They might not use the word anxiety in the Bible. <laughs> you know, you can't just do a word study on anxiety. You have to really think about what the scripture is communicating and then think about how you can uh, apply it to that person's situation. I don't have it many minutes left. Um, I want to talk about something, though. Let me see if I have a slide for it. I don't. Okay. I just mentioned this really quickly. There's a book called Jesus Calling. Has anyone heard of that? Okay, it's very popular. I don't know a whole lot about it. I know enough about it. I've read enough about it to, to get kind of the main point I wanted to make from this. Sarah Young is who wrote it. Um, this is probably in the top five most popular books, Christian books in the last 20 years. We're talking millions and millions sold. In the intro, she says, I began to wonder if I could receive messages during my times of communing with God. I had been writing in prayer journals for years, but that was one-way communication. I did all the talking. I knew that God communicated with me through the Bible, but I yearned for something more. Increasingly, I wanted to hear what God had to say to me personally on a given day. Um, a lot of theologians, I, man, if I had time, I would give you a lot of these quotes say that this book is borderline heresy and blasphemous. Because what, what she's actually claiming is that, and what she actually says is, I have the Bible, and you know there's good stuff in it, and it's helpful, but what I really want is God to just speak to me. As if this isn't relevant, this doesn't actually give me what I need, what I really need is just to be super quiet and attentive to the voice of God and just kind of, hear from him. And what is that saying? I, and I'm a continuationist. I believe in all the gifts. I'm not saying God can't speak outside of the Bible today. I don't think that's normative. I don't think we should expect to hear that. But w when, when we say, I know the Bible has a lot of good stuff to say, but what I really want is God to tell me, should I take this road or this road? Should I eat this food or this food? You know, should I talk to this person or maybe go 
to that person or go to that country or this country. God, tell me. When we start asking for direct revelation from God like that, what are we, at, what are we saying about the sufficiency of the scripture? That's a, that's a big theological issue we really need to think through. And that becomes super practical when ministering to people. And again, I'm not, I'm not saying that God doesn't speak outside of Scripture, although I don't think we should uh, expect that as anything normative, like a daily basis, God just talks to me. He talks to you through the Word. And what He says to you through the Word is the greatest thing He could ever say to you. Okay, And so that's where our confidence ultimately is. We need to be careful uh, of approaches that would say otherwise. Um, I'm going to leave out the rest of what I got, and maybe we can get to it next time because I want to give Cody enough time. Let me uh, let me pray for us, Father. Lord, we thank you for your word, Lord. You've given us what we need, and uh, and we're grateful, Lord. And not only that, you've given us your Holy Spirit to make us sufficient. We are not sufficient, but you make us sufficient. Uh, by giving us your Son and your Holy Spirit. And so, Lord, help us um, to go forth with much confidence ministering your word uh, to others. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.